Good morning, church. Thank you guys for being here this morning. Good morning, friends and family in Zoom land. Boy, that's a, a new phrase, isn't it? Zoom world, Zoom land, Zoom this, Zoom that. <laughs> Before we get started, if you guys don't mind, I just got a little personal um, testimony. Uh, and I want to do a little reading. So if you want to stay seated for a moment, feel free to do that. And uh, our friends and family at home, um, if you want to look at your Bibles and, and follow along with me, you're, you're welcome to do that. Um, so this is February vacation, and at the risk of sounding very much like a teacher, um, I'm very happy for the opportunity of time. Time to kind of unwind a little bit, maybe Sabbath a little, and just kind of um, what I call my brain dump, when I kind of see where I'm at and uh, absorb some of God's word. So one of the things I do for my brain dump to slow down the process of the anxiety and stress of the world is to just look at scripture and write it down. Um, and I do that in journals, I do that in, on index cards or sticky notes. Any of you guys do that? I mean, yeah. just get it down and slow down the moment and really try and absorb. So if you don't mind, I'd like to read this. Um, this comes from Paul. Oh, how powerful um, the word of God is. It is a sure, steady, reliable foundation and Paul is so elo eloquent in this. This comes from Colossians 1, 15 to 20. And I, and I wrote this because I'm looking for confidence in God. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. And I got a little blurb that I, <laughs> I just do a little more. Uh, Jesus was first given authority by our Father to reconcile every creature, including me, with my blemishes and behaviors. I am freed from accusation if I continue to have faith, planted and firm in the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is great news. I pray for the wooing and grace to come. Amen. We'll start our uh, service together in song, so those of you who are able to stand, that would be great.
please join me in uh, the good news, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all our As we look not for the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal.
You may be seated. Thanks, Rick. Well, happy Valentine's Day. It's good to be together this morning. Let's pray. Father God, we recognize that in our world there are many kings. And there's lots of powerful people. And even this week, as we look around our country, we've seen a lot of these powerful people making important decisions. Lord, some people would completely uh, disagree with the way that those decisions were made. Others disagree with the outcome of some of these big decisions. Lord, we have no control over these things. In fact, we are so wise to actually know that we don't have much control today, even just over how our day goes. So we are just so grateful that you really are the king, that you have not lost any of your control on this world. We are so grateful that you are at work and that we can put all of our confidence and all of our hope in you. What is absolutely the very best thing that could be done for us, you are doing. Lord, it may not seem that way for us and we may not understand it. It may be difficult. Often, often it's very painful. Often it causes us a lot of confusion. But Lord, it is so good for us to be able just to know today that you are the king And it is out of the overflow of the heart of love that is just kind of defines who you are, that you are working. And God, you are working for us and you are working for our children. Lord, some of them, they make our lives hard. Lord, some of them, they have left us brokenhearted. Lord, some of them seem like they are out of control. And yet you have not lost control at all. Our hope is in you. Lord, some of the events around our world seem out of our control. But it's good to know that you, again, you are God and that you are on your throne and we can trust you. And we trust you to do what is absolutely the best day in and day out. Lord, would you just help us this week to be able to trust you again. Lord, not to have to give way to anxiety or fear or concern. Lord, may we not be so afraid of what uh, what we can't control and what is out of our hands. Instead, Lord, could could you help us just to be able to walk with you and trust you and lean on you? God, we're so grateful for the things that we've seen you doing. We're grateful for the way that you have taken care of Sarah and Don. We ask that you would continue to heal and take care of them. God, I uh, am praying, we, we keep praying for Carol and her, her grandbabies, and we just ask for these young, beautiful little children. We ask for protection for these little ones and ask for uh, continued uh, growth and provision for them. Thank you for reminding us that life starts at conception. Thank you for for demonstrating that you give life and that life is miraculous and amazing. And we just ask for a continued perspective on that each day. Lord, we want to pray for our country. We want to pray for uh, our friends and our family members. We want to pray for our kids who this year has been just a strange year for them as they go to school. Help them with their classes. Help them with uh, the assignments they've got. Help them with just the different type of year that this is. Lord, we love our, our children. And we ask that you would take care of them. And I do. I pray, Father, for parents who maybe their kids are are struggling. Maybe their kids are in the hospital right now trying to be healed up. Lord, we ask that you would bring healing for some of them. Lord, for our children who, um, who don't know you or don't love you, we just ask that you would continue to give patience and time. Uh, Lord, we, can, we ask that you would continue to work, to show, to demonstrate, like Vicki said, to woo and win their hearts towards you. 
We know this world makes lots of promises. And so many of those promises seem so good and they seem so much better. But Lord, we know that those promises can't be kept. And we know that what we were made for is to know you, to love you, and to worship you. And we want that for our children. So no matter what age our kids are, Lord, would you just, would you work that into their lives? Would you cause that? And would you cause that to continue to grow in our lives too? Thank you, Jesus. We trust you. We praise you. We pray it in your name. Amen. So a few things real quickly to start off with today. For uh, First, just again, happy Valentine's Day. Just so grateful for all of you. And I hope that you get to enjoy some time together with the people that you love. I hope that you feel love today. And I hope that you get to express that kind of love today too. Uh, we pray especially for those who might feel um, maybe alone. Because we realize that there's a lot of people in our world who are there. And we pray for those who maybe feel like nobody cares. And we just want to, uh, we want to change that. We, we would love to be able to express love and live love uh, with each other in a way that we would, we would know that we are deeply cared about. Um, I wanted to also just pass on one or two things. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to pass on to you is... Uh, as cases are dropping and as we're kind of getting a little bit more, hopefully, by the grace of God, into kind of a, a, a little different pattern around here, we have been talking and Cassie Lloyd has been willing to volunteer to kind of bring together uh, some children's ministry things for our, our littlest ones. And right now what we're looking at is starting that kind of slow so we can build back into it steady. So the thought is this. Uh, the first Sunday in March, Cassie and Hannah are going to be here to provide child care, you know, kind of that Sunday school time for our kids that are kind of older than nursery, so kind of past that uh, toddler where they need constant attention, uh, up through kind of early elementary. I didn't get a better definition of that than that. So we'll figure out exactly what that age kind of is, because some of us feel early elementary, even though we're a little older than that. But they're going to, what they'll do is they would come in on a Sunday morning, and um, those kids would come right downstairs. We'd kind of gather some information, and they'll stay down there for the entire service. And then parents can come up here and be part of our gathered worship as well. So uh, we're really grateful for those of you who are a part of that. If there's some of us who would like to be part of that uh, teaching rotation as we kind of get that moving forward because we just want to be safe. We want to make sure that our kids are safe. We want to make sure that others are safe. We're going to kind of roll into that. So we'll start at once a month as a goal, and then we're going to kind of, I'm sure, start to add to that as well. So um, I just wanted to kind of mention that to you. If you have questions, you could reach out to me or you could talk to Cassie. I know she's been talking with Shannon and uh, Amy, and, and we've been trying to kind of pull some of those people together, but we love our kids. We know these are hard times for our kids, and um, it's really important for them to get to have a Sunday morning where they get to feel connected and cared about, and it also can help our parents as well, because um, you guys do a lot, and you love them a lot, and um, this could give you an opportunity to kind of sit and hopefully be encouraged in God's word as well. So that's one of the things there. Second thing I just wanted to mention is, I was looking back through our uh, pictures, because last year we would have been at snow camp with our teenagers. We opted not to do a snow camp this year, um, just because of the COVID numbers were all on their way up, and, and it just didn't seem like a wise thing for us to go and do. But So pray for our teenagers. We had so much fun together last year. We have six seniors that are graduating as a church this year, which is amazing uh, to have that many great teenage seniors in high school. That's a rarity. You know, if, if, you, if you haven't been around youth ministries, it's rare. It's rare to have seniors in high school, and we have a whole great past love them. And then we got this other whole great group of, of younger uh, seventh graders and 
all the way down to fifth graders. And that whole group gets together, uh, together on Wednesday night. They all wear masks. We change this entire building around. We play soccer or stool ball or every man for himself dodgeball or some other variant dodgeball or something like that. We play that all up here and then we go downstairs and they always take time to pray together and we have a snack together and we look at God's word together. So just keep praying for those teenagers as well. They're a, a fantastic group and they really are um, amazing. If, if you want some encouragement about the next generation, if you want to know that there's hope for the next generation, this group would give it to you, I promise you. So those are a couple of the things that are, are kind of going on for us around here, and I just wanted to pass those on, give you a little encouragement and a little, a little hope, okay? Uh, so let's take our Bibles. We're going to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Let me remind you where we've been and what we're, we're talking through. I'm not going to do a full recap, but just briefly let me remind you that we're talking about the Jesus way. And what is Jesus working on in our world? And we're seeing that God's great passion, the, the, the ringing tune inside of God's heart, the, the tune that he can't ever get over singing is he wants people to be rescued from that place where they are self-dependent, where they have to try and figure out how to live their very best lives and they ha- they're forced to take care of themselves a place of rebellion and a place of isolation and a place that really is fueled by the flames of hell. He wants to rescue them from that place and bring them into his kingdom to bring them into his presence. He wants to free them and make them children. That is God's great passion and and that's the work that he is doing. He wants them to experience what life is like connected to him because he is the source of life, and he is the source of all hope. So, so that's what God's big heart has been. And we've been looking at a few different things. Last week, what we looked at was this. Last week, we found out that uh, on the next slide, it says, our tongues really are, are, are transformed by the saving work of God. God's Spirit can use your voice to speak his word into other people's lives for their salvation, and for their encouragement. Did you know that? The Holy Spirit loves to use you. Now, yeah, we need some transforming work to go on. We, we need, we need uh, to change. But one of the great gifts that God has given to you and to me is to be a voice. And we literally looked at that word prophet last week. Remember? Moses sighed, I wish it wasn't just these 70 elders. I wish it was everybody. And Joel then uh, took that prophecy from God. He took the word of God and said, someday it won't just be those 70 elders. Someday it'll be your children. Your sons and your daughters are going to do this. And then in Acts chapter 2, we saw that Peter stood up and said, this is the day. This is the day where every single child of God gets to speak the word of God to others. That's encouraging for us. What we want to do today is I want to look at Ephesians chapter 4 briefly. And then I want to address again this this outflow. So let's take a look at Ephesians chapter 4. We'll begin at verse 11. And this is what it says. This is a a favorite, this is a critical passage for us as we build like what a church should be. Ephesians 4 has to be in there. We find out that God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints. Now that list of five, those are some specific types of people. But don't forget, like we looked at last week, What that also means to us is that every single one of you is going to have your own unique role, your own unique kind of thing that you gravitate towards. Some of you are going to sit there and say, I am willing and and trained and capable to stand up on a Sunday morning and preach. 
But there's a whole bunch of people who sit there and go, oh, last thing, don't want that. That's the last thing that would have. I just saw some hands raised right there, okay? And guess what? God is good with that because there's different ways through some of the experiences you've been through, through some of the personality things that God's done for you, God's not looking for you to be like the person next to you. God just wants you to be able to function the way that he made you. So some of you are going to be really good at encouraging others. Some of you are going to be really good at listening to others when they're going through hard things. Some of you are going to be really good at at sharing Jesus with people who've never heard about him before. But God's not saying all of you need to be the same. And I love that in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. God's saying, let me, let you do what you do and find out that that matters. Okay? So then he says, all of those different roles are necessary in order to what? Verse 12, equip the saints to do the work of ministry. We've been talking about this concept that As a church, our calling has been, as long as I've been the senior pastor here, that we are going to be an every member ministry. Every single one of us is called to this prophetic ministry. Now that sounds big, that sounds heavy, that sounds weighty. Don't freak out, okay? It's okay. What we're saying is, Each of us gets to share. We get to speak into people's lives. Some people will do it with a microphone. Most of us are going to do it person to person. But the way that we're going to be equipped, the goal that God has for his people is that instead of just showing up on a Sunday and and just gaining or listening, that God says, I also want to use you. And I'm going to equip you. And it's going to be stretching at times, but it'll be good. And I'm going to let you speak God's word into other people's lives. So we're going to equip them for the work of ministry. And that's going to build up the body of Christ, the second half of verse 12, until we all attain to the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God to become mature to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So picture a glass, you get a drink, you go to a restaurant, and they pour you a drink. I don't want you to get like partway, and I don't want you to fill it all up with ice, right? I want it full. I want like the top edge. I want to not be able to pick it up. I want to have to lean over on the table and give it a little sip when I get to the top of it, right? That's what he's talking about. Imagine being... As a group, the way that it, as each of us kind of learn how to do this, as each of us depend on each other to do this, we grow up into the fullness. We get filled up with the Spirit of Christ. Remember, disciples are Christ followers. They're learning what it was like, like how Jesus followed God, and we're learning how to do the same thing. We, we get filled up to the very top. Isn't that a great goal? Don't you long for that? To have less maybe of me <laughs> and more of who Jesus is? That's the goal. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna mature, mature manhood to the measure of the stature, the fullness of Christ, so that we'll no longer be like children that are tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunningness, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Instead of my life feeling like I got ripped up off of the ground and off my foundations and then I'm just kind of going wherever life sends me or, or when I have a hard day, all of a sudden I feel like I'm completely adrift in, instead of that and instead of me having to go, wow, what's the coolest, latest person who's talking on YouTube? Let me just kind of listen to everything he says. Stability. Confidence, a place to stand, a place to find hope. That's what he's talking about. And rather, look at verse 15. This exactly fits what we were talking about last week. Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. 
Who's speaking? Well, remember back in verse 12, we said that the saints, and how many of you in this room are saints? All of you. Every single one of you should raise your hands. Now, you may not feel like it. Trust me, I know the feeling. But God said that you are saints. If you're not a saint, you're an ain't. <laughs> okay, if you're not a saint, you're an ain't. So, so if you're a saint, that means that, that we're growing up into the fullness of Christ. We're, we're joined together, the whole body joined together, verse 16, joined and held together by every joint. Every single one of you is that, is that connection point from which it's equipped when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. We cannot function without you. We, we can't just function through Zoom. Does that mean anti-technology? No, it means that technology is great. But what it means is we need each of us, every single one of us, to be part of this kind of ministry. And that's what God's calling you to. Now that's kind of different than what I run into even when I visit other churches. I had a chance during uh, my trip down to Philly to go to a great church, a church that's growing and, and, and doing a good job, and, and I love it. But I noticed that um, they have lots of people in, in, involved in ministries, and they're calling lots of people to be involved in ministries. And I see this lots of places that I go. But too often what happens is when they call everybody to be part of that ministry, what they're calling them to do is to sign up to be a list to maybe administrate something or to, um, to be a welcomer when people come in. And all of these tasks are really important. To serve on the tech team, we need people who will serve on the tech team. We need all of these roles. But sometimes when we hear that, what we want to picture is, okay, if this is an every member ministry, what he wants me to be is on a roster. He wants me to organize something. He wants me to run something. He wants me to help with the property. He wants me to do some other kind of practical task. And those are good things for us to do. But there's more to it. There's more to it. So we're not just trying to sign people up to be on a certain team. What we're doing is we're saying, God actually wants you to be one of those people who speaks God's word into other people's lives and perseveres in walking with them. That's what we're talking about. Now, that in and of itself can be pretty intimidating when I say that. Because you sit there and go, okay, hand me a shovel. I'll shovel walkways all day long. <sighs> what, you're, what you're talking about sounds different than that. And it is. So let me just hit two big barriers that tend to scare people. There's two big barriers. The first one is motivation. The second one's inferiority. Motivation. Sometimes there's a personal kind of reluctance or an embarrassment to speak. I'm worried about doing this because what if I mess up? Somebody else is better at this. I've heard, you know, this guy do it. When Joel speaks to somebody, man, it sounds so good and it fits so well and it's so helpful. When Heath speaks to somebody, man, it's just right on and it, and it just hits the heart of the matter and they know exactly what they're doing. When Norm speaks into somebody's life, he's going to make a chart out of it and it's really going to be helpful for people. But when I do it, it seems like it's just mush. So sometimes motivation is tough for us. And the second one is inferiority. Let me just describe that. Inferiority is where we feel inadequate. We lack confidence. We don't know where to start. So let me just hit those two things really quickly. I think we have a slide with those two names up on there. But motivation, let me just say this. When it comes to motivation, this big barrier, can I just be honest with us? A lot of motivation problems, a lot of us will probably point to the second thing. We'll say, oh, I'm inferior on this. 
But one of the truths is, is so often it comes because it's not something that I love or something that I feed on or something maybe that I have experienced. So I don't see it as all that important. That's why I call it motivation. But what's the truth? The truth is this. You can't help but talk about what you love. We bring our answer to everybody for everything. Whatever it is that you love the most is what you will definitely talk about. Whatever is the big ringing answer in your life is the answer that you'll give to other people. Maybe it's essential oils. I don't actually even know what those are, but I see people talking about them a lot. Maybe it's, maybe it's like one of those um, uh, beach body kind of things, the workout type of things. Again, is it good? Yes. And I see a lot of people talking about those things. Maybe it's your basketball team, or, or maybe it's whatever, whatever those types of things. But can I say this? When it comes to motivation, one of the big challenges for us is that we don't share God's word with people because we haven't found it life-giving and life-changing. I've seen some people who have no training, you know, and they would sit there and themselves say, I have no skill. And yet they have found in God and in his word, life. And you can't shut those people up. And I love it. It is so fresh and it is so real. But there are definitely some times, and and I'm in this, right? The problem is we don't always value the Word of God enough. And we don't love people enough. It's It's a heart problem, isn't it? Our hearts are not sufficiently warmed and tenderized and 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 heated by the wonder of God's mercies and the majesty of Jesus Christ. And and our hearts aren't really full to overflowing with the love and the compassion that we should have for people around us. So then somebody stands up in a pulpit like this and they say, hey, isn't that true? And I know there's a whole bunch of us who sit there and go, yeah, that's me sometimes. And now I feel even twice as horrible because now I hear you telling me that I should just be like, I should should just kind of like you know, just strain really hard and make it happen in my life. And I've tried that before and it doesn't seem to work. What do I do? How do I? If that's my problem, then Mark, you got to give me an answer. You got to tell me how that can change. Because it's easy to stand up here and say, boy, we should all love God more. It's even easier to stand up here and go, you guys should love God more. You know, that's the preacher thing, right? It's harder to answer the question, hey, if that's where I'm at, what do I do? And that's why it's my heartbeat to answer that question so many times. Ask for it. It sounds so simple. It sounds too simple. But how often do we say, God, would you just light my heart up? So that when Vicky's leading us in song, that when we go through those lyrics... I'm not just saying words, but that my heart rings with it. What do we do? In my life, the thing I have found is to ask for it. God, could you light a fire inside of my heart using the word of God and I will continue to persevere and I will ask other people to speak this into my life And I will spend time in your word so I can be near it. But God, could you kind of light that fire? Could you you work in there? Some of you older people remember Keith Green. Talk about a guy who had a huge influence on me. If you don't know who he is, I'll tell you later. Great Christian musician. But I remember even as a kid in like seventh grade, he had this one song that was, My Eyes Are dry 
my heart is hard, you know, and, and, and it was that kind of thing. And sitting there going, I resonate with that. What do I do? I'm just here to tell you, ask for it. We need to just ask God to enlighten the eyes of our heart, like Vicki was sharing in Colossians chapter 1 today. We need to ask God to stir up. We need to ask God to work on that. We need to be around people who are also in that same place who will help us to grow. We want our kids to sense that for us this matters. We don't want to be cold. We, even in the middle of COVID-19, we want that firebox. We've got a wood stove. We burn a wood stove 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It just keeps going, right? What do I want inside the wood stove? I do not want it to be cold. I do not want it to be dark. What do I need? Well, I need flame. I need fire inside of there. Right? That's the Spirit's doing. What does he tend to add in there? Well, I put logs in mine. I put wood in mine to keep my wood stove going. What does the Spirit tend to take? God's Word. Whether I cut it up or whether somebody else cut it up, someone else brings it to me and, and, and it feeds it in there and that's what keeps that fire alive. This is why Sunday mornings, gathered worship is so important. It's one of the key opportunities where we are challenged in what we read and what we sing and what we say and in what we get preached to us to be reminded to have somebody else be able to just speak this into our hearts and souls. That's why Sundays matter. And it's not just the preaching on Sunday morning. Sometimes it's when we're downstairs having coffee afterwards or we're, we're talking with a friend while we're sitting in one of the offices and they're able to speak God's word into our soul, into our specific context and into our need. It's just one of the rhythms that we have that opens doors for us. That's why we shouldn't forsake the gathering together. That's why it's important to be here. And it's also why we need these other opportunities. Some of these great Groups that meet throughout our region, um, some that are going to be starting once we get over this whole uh, COVID thing. That's why we need to sit down at shoots and have breakfast once in a while. That's why we need to call each other and just encourage each other at times. All of this is important in order to keep that fire going. So let me say the more dangerous one is motivation. It's a heart that has tasted and says, oh, man, that's good. Motivation. The second one is inferiority. I get this one. Trust me. I am not the guy who ever walks into my life going, I know how to do this kind of stuff. I'm the guy who walks into my life constantly and goes, I don't know how to do this stuff. I am, I am not the overconfident guy. I am always the underconfident guy. And the little voices in my head are always like, don't say anything because you'll look stupid. And I'm like, well, I do anyway, so let's just try it. But inferiority. And we can recognize, hey, this is a big deal for us because we lack confidence. Now, back to motivation. Motivation. People who have never taken a class on how to share their faith but have come to know Jesus, share their faith anyway. They don't even know what they don't know and they just start talking about it. That's why I say motivation is more important on this because there's a whole bunch of us who have a ton of information on this. But if the motive's not there, we're not going to do it. We're going to say, I need another class. All right? So, so let's not build up too big of a wall here. But let's also just remind you, when, I, when we talk about this as elders, when we talk about this, I'm not asking you to uh, suddenly walk up to a stranger in the middle of Walmart and start sharing Jesus with them. I'm not asking you to set up a chalkboard like Dwight or Jeff used to do in Montreal and try and draw a crowd and get them to all listen about Jesus. I'm not asking you to be as bold as Patty Jean to sit up here with a guitar on a Sunday and listen to her sing and put everything out there I'm not asking, we're not asking all of you to do that. That would scare you, rightfully so, okay? 
All I want to do is make it a regular priority in our lives to say, God, who is it that you want me to eat with? Remember our, our rhythms? Bless. Who can, I, who can I be a blessing to this week? Who could I listen to? Who could I eat with? Who should I speak to? Who should I spend Sabbath restful time with? And, and then just pay attention to what God's telling you to do. So, so often what God does is he sits there and goes, hey, they're hurting. I want you to listen to them. Oh God, I'd mess that up. You need a professional counselor. I haven't gone to school yet for this. God's like, no, I don't need a professional counselor. I got you. Would you just listen? Or, or maybe, maybe God sits there and goes, hey, you know that verse that you read and that meant a lot to you? This is the perfect place. This is what they need to hear. Why don't you just tell them that? Oh, God, that's too big. That, you know, we need, there's people who are good at this. God's like, no, you can do this. Okay? Point them to the promises of God. This can sometimes look like a spouse asking their love. Would you just sit down and read God's word with me for 15 minutes this week? I know it's supposed to be 15 minutes a day and it's supposed to be all these other kind of things, but guys, that's not what I'm talking about. God will help us to be able to take the little steps. Just one step to the right. Or as Norm likes to say, one step towards the light. Let's just, let's just, let's be available. So when it comes to the inferiority side, we also want to come alongside, we want to continue to equip you so that you can have confidence so that when God calls you to take a step to the right, that you can patiently, prayerfully, carefully, intentionally walking with them and, and, and um, be there to seek others' good, not just our own. So if you feel inferior, you're in a great crowd of people who probably feel super inferior, right? Amen? There's a lot of us in here who God has used time and time again who feel inferior. So don't let that be the big thing. We got resources to help you. But I just want you to know that God will very likely call you beyond where you're comfortable. We call it the faith cycle. We'll come back to that in just a minute, okay? Real quick, let me just answer this question, because when we first started talking this way 17 years ago, hard, hard to believe, somebody said to me, well, then what do we need you for? <laughs> if every person's going to be a minister, and if every person's going to carry out this kind of ministry, what do we, you know, they weren't being mean. They're just kind of saying, well, what do we need you for? And that one set me back because I didn't have an answer. <laughs> I've, I've developed an answer since then. So let me just give it to you in case you're thinking, Mark just wants to work less. No, that is not the answer. Okay. The answer is this. Sunday morning preaching, praying, singing, speaking is the foundational word ministry that feeds and regulates and builds all of the other ministry here. It, you, you know, um, Ivan and I were talking about this the other day. We were talking on the phone. You know how sometimes like an acapella group, before they sing, what does somebody do? They, yeah, they break out that little pitch thingy and they blow one note. Why do they do it? Because when they start to sing, they all need to be on the same key. Now, I didn't start playing music until I was in my 30s, and I'm still not the greatest at it, but it's an awesome thing to get to play music with other people. But it's not an awesome thing if people are in the same key. 
<laughs> There's no way for it to sound good. What we preach, teach, exemplify, talk about on a Sunday morning here acts as that little pitch pipe. The first thing it does is it makes sure that we're all in the same key. The second thing it does is allows us as elders to guard the sound deposit of the gospel so that everybody who's part of this church will know it clearly and thoroughly. It's also, third, the foundational place where we all learn how to read and speak the gospel truth on our own. That's why we we do expository preaching. So that you can sit there and go, hey, he's not that bright. In other words, this isn't something I could never have thought of. Instead, you can go, hey, I get that. I see what he's thinking. I see how you read God's word. And if I read it, you know, because I expect people to get ahead of me quite a bit. And you're reading it and you're ahead of me and you think, hey, I think this means this. And then I say, it means this. And you're like, bingo, got it. That encourages you. That encourages you to sit there and go, I'm on the right path. So our elders, fourth, are leaders in chief. So this expository pulpit is incredibly important because it really anchors and builds a church of people who can go out and speak day to day in their little places. So that's why that's why we need elders. Let me take this last thing now real quickly. I call it venturing into the unknown. Because when you sit there and you say, okay, God, I've probably done this a lot, but it makes me a little nervous when Mark kind of prioritizes this and says, this is the role because I feel inferior. I recognize that I need a growing sense of motivation. But the biggest thing is I'm probably going to be stepping into some places that are kind of unknown. One of the best things that ever happened to me when I was a teenager was going to work at camp. Now, I'm not saying that every kid should go work at camp. What I'm saying is, for me, it was a really big deal. I had great churches. I had Bible classes. Like I told you, I went to Christian school all my life. I had great classes. I studied topics that, you know, I had teachers who taught all these things. I had boys' brigade troops. I went to youth groups. Uh, I had lots of different ministry things that I was involved in, but it really didn't start to take root until I went to camp. Because a lot of these things over here, when I was in my churches or when I was in my youth group or when I was in my Bible classes, when I did those things, I was told to be a learner and a listener. Now, the good thing about that is Go back to the wood stove illustration. It's like stacking cordwood. I didn't use much of it. (laughs) I I just stacked it away and I kind of sat there and go, what do I do with all this stuff? And and you end up with a couple cords of it, right? Because you have all this information, notebooks full, Bibles that are all scratched up with notes in them. But it wasn't until God called me over here at camp And at camp, what they said was, we are asking you, we are demanding of you that you now become a gospel speaker. Now, it wasn't to stand up on a pulpit and speak. It was years before they let me do that. (laughs) And I did horribly the very first time I did it. I probably did horribly the first 250 times I did it, even here. All right? But... What they said to me was, Mark, you are 16 years old and now you have a cabin of 10-year-olds. You are responsible to do a devotion for them every night. I don't know what to do. So what did I do? I dug into the things from God's word that helped me. The things that I had read, I shared with them. They also said, Mark, you're also responsible now to share Jesus and make sure that each of these kids knows who Jesus is and see if they might want to come to know Jesus themselves. 
Well, I remembered that one time over in this stack of wood over here, Dan Darling had done a sermon and he gave me the Romans mod modified Romans road. And I had that marked in my Bible because I thought that might be important. So I took that piece of wood and I brought it over here and I said, okay, I'm going to start using that. And that's what I did. 323, 623, 10, 9. Bam, let's go through it, right? Romans. And that's what we did. But what they did was they asked me, they gave me this responsibility. They called me to an every member ministry. And there were lots of times that I felt in over my head. There were very few times that I felt like I had somebody who would walk with me with their head on my shoulder and would say, here, let me, let's do the teaching method. I'll do it first. Then we'll do it together. And then you do it. And then you'll be confident. Never, like never. They threw me. They threw me into this. You know what? Those were some of the best times. I mentioned that faith cycle thing. Norm gets credit for this because he kind of took a bunch of our experiences and put it into this. I wish I still had the drawing. I got to get that from you, Norm. But what, what it was, was the concept that we sit there and say, all right, God is calling on my life and I see a need, I see a place, I see an opportunity. And, and that's kind of like the top part of the circle but then it starts to drop off because it becomes sort of a leap of faith because we say, I don't know if I can do this. This seems like this, this is beyond what I feel comfortable or capable of. And at that moment, we have an opportunity. We can either abandon the cycle and sit there and say, okay, God, it's not going to happen because you've got to find somebody who's better than me. Or... We look at it and go, okay, God, I trust you. I don't trust me. I don't feel like I can do this, but I trust you, so I'm going to do it. And we jump in. And you know what's amazing? Kind of as you cycle around this way, God does it. Through us, he uses us. And we sit there and go, I don't know what I said. I don't know how I said it. I don't know where that came from. I didn't even know I knew that verse, but I guess I did know that verse. <laughs> and we come here. Who gets all the credit at that point? It's not us. We're not sitting there going, man, I'm so good at this. Instead, we're sitting there going, God, you're so good. I can't believe you could help me with that. But what's the result as we come back up this way? We love God more. We, our heart, the, the, little, the little embers that are in there, they get fanned and it flames it. And it builds more fire so that we come back up to the top again. What's the next thing going to happen? God's going to say, here's something I want you to do. <laughs> and we go, again, God, I don't know how to do that. That's too big for me. I can't handle this. And he's like, yes, you can. Boom. And he takes us through it. And he brings us all the way around again. And this is the cycle of our lives. Man, that's what I grew in. That's how I learned to love God. And by grace, by the grace of God, I was helped all along the way. No, I, though I, I never felt like I had nearly enough help or guidance. I didn't have Yoda to walk with me. I didn't have anybody, you know, kind of doing all this stuff with me. But God's spirit and God's word and God's people were enough to help even a fool like me. And I'm so thankful for the people who were patient. And they put up with my attempts and my growth and my learning and my inability. Top of that list is you guys. You've been patient. You've understood that seminary does not complete a guy. You've let me grow. And I am so thankful for that. I feel like I'm stuck in that same loop, and it's not a bad thing. It's a growing thing. I wouldn't trade it for the world. And it's the only reason why I would invite you to join me in it. Because this is the best place we can be. So you think through it. Moms, this is why God gave you that little boy who jumps off everything. 
You know, this, this, is, this is why God gives you family that sometimes drives you nuts. This is why God gives you neighbors. This is why God gives you co-workers. This is why God brings you because he wants to keep bringing you to that point where he sits there and goes, hey, here's a need. Here's something I want to do. Come with me. I can do this with you. And he wants us to find out that even if he could, even though he could clearly do this all by himself, he doesn't want to. He loves to do it with his kids. Because he wants them to find out that they, they're used and they're powerful and they can make a difference in the world. That's what God's doing. I share my story kind of about camp because I want to just encourage all of us that the greatest things, the times where I felt the closest to God, the times where I felt like I loved God the most were probably the times that were the least comfortable. But they were the times that made the biggest difference. And God is calling you to those same places. Don't forget, it's unlikely that he's going to suddenly jump you six grades ahead. What's he going to do? He's going to say, today in math, we're going to learn this. Right, like our teachers do with our kids. Today in science, we're going to learn this. One little step is 180 days. How many days? 175 days a year, and you're just going to keep growing, and you will be right on track. God says, I can get you there. This is what we're doing. This is where we're headed. This is the, the, the amazing master plan, okay? If it's discouraging, like if you sit there and go, wow, that's not a great plan. Sorry, not all that impressive. But if you sit there and say, man, I would love to actually get to walk with God that way. I'd love to get to speak into someone else's life the way that somebody else spoke into my life at this key time. God wants to do it. All right, Father, help us. Help us not to be afraid Lord, help us not to be faint of heart either. Instead, stir up our zeal for you. Let us spend time in your word. Let us spend time with others so that will encourage us and fan that into flame so that we are on fire inside instead of passive or cold or lukewarm. And Lord, let us speak to our children and let us speak to our friends and the people that we meet at the gym. Let us speak to both believers and non-believers. Lord, we want to be used by you because we want to walk with you. We want to be with you. Just like the disciples, we want to follow you because we want to learn how to be and share your attributes. So help us, I pray. Thank you, Jesus, for all the hope that this gives us. We pray it in your name. Amen. So as we uh, finish today, we're going to sing our last song, and then we'll do the sending out. So you can uh, stand and join.
this is the best verse, isn't it? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I, I pray that that goes with you in your word and that you share that word with others in his strength. God bless. Have a good week. Thank you.